<laughs> usually tell you to keep a passage open before you, keep your Bible open before you tonight, whereas we're from Genesis to the book of Revelation, as we think of the tree of life. Well, I, I, I hope you agree, I'm sure you agree, that trees are absolutely amazing. Uh, I've been reading a little book, as I was sharing with you last Lord's Day, about uh, trees in the Bible, uh, written by a man who obviously loves trees, and he's a scientist as well, and trying to encourage people to grow trees, but he has this wonderful book written, written about all the, the times trees appears in, uh, appear in the Bible. Apparently there are over six, 60,000 different species of trees. I don't know how many you passed on the way here this evening, but I doubt if you passed anywhere near that. Some are stunning to look at. Maybe one day you'll, have, you'll stand beside a giant redwood tree and look up, be amazed at the heights. Some have sat by riversides and been amazed at a weeping willow. Or in the month of April or May, whenever it comes, the cherry blossom on the trees. It is beautiful. They are beautiful. We thank God for his creation. How kind of God to give us a beautiful world to live in. Some of the trees are useful. Uh, I don't imagine your house would stand up if it weren't for trees. Somewhere there'll be a lot of wood in it. Uh, you've probably had today some food from a tree. Uh, maybe you had a walk earlier today and took some shade from a tree. Maybe you've had some medicine out of the medicine cabinet today and it's come from a tree. And uh, apparently they're good for your mental health. I take a walk every morning through the park, hear the birds sing in the tree and it does my soul good. Of course, without trees, well, would you exist at all? Don't they take in all the stuff that we breathe out? And the wonderful ways of God change it all so that we can breathe in oxygen. I know that's a little bit simple, but uh, we get some life from it. So trees are amazing. They've made their way into mythology and into literature. Uh, we're Lord of the Rings fans in our family. We've recently just been through the trilogy of films uh, again over past weeks. If you haven't seen them, you should see them. They're wonderful. And Tolkien wrote, wrote about the Ents of Fangorn Forest and the famous tree beards leading them out eventually. Well, we're thinking in these, in these services of not mythological trees, but real trees. Trees of important historical events. The fall with regards to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And earlier today, the tree of salvation as we looked at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, when our Lord died on the tree. And this evening, we're, considered, we're considering another real tree as it was in Eden. And as it was uh, used in Revelation then to typify the blessings of heaven. So as we had our readings, we're jumping from Genesis to Revelation to consider the tree of life. And we want to notice three things about it. First of all, the identification of the tree. If you Google the tree of life, you'll find that there is a, a, a tree today that has got a nickname, the tree of life. It is the uh, baobab tree, a rather strange looking tree. It's a big fat stump at the bottom, looks as if it's up, upside down almost, but that's not the tree we're thinking about. Uh, you'll not find this tree in a tree magazine. Uh, you'll not be able to, to speak to your dendrologist friend and, uh, or visit a website and find out about this tree. But Moses, he was guided by the Spirit of God to tell us what we needed to know about the tree of life. We read there in Genesis chapter 2 that the Lord had provided a very special place for Adam and Eve. He didn't just plunk them uh, in the world that it was beautiful and perfect, but we're told that uh, Adam and Eve were given a very special place in chapter 2 and, uh, and verse 8. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. What a, a perfect Wonderful place it was, a real place. As real as this place, a wonderful place for Adam and Eve. Uh, they were provided abundantly in it. In Genesis 2.9, saw something about last Lord's Day. And out of the ground the Lord made a spring 
uh, or sorry, made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So everywhere they looked, these uh, luxurious trees, beautiful to look at and provided food to eat. It was paradise. Um, in fact, when the, uh, the Greek version of the Old Testament was, uh, was translated, when it comes to speak of this garden, uh, the garden in Eden, they used the word uh, paradise. So it was a, a beautiful place, a wonderful place. And there in the midst of it, chapter 2, verse 9, the tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Not hid away anywhere, not out of sight, not in some distant place, but right in the midst of the garden where Adam and Eve would see it every day, this wonderful tree of life, and with it the knowledge of tree, a tree of, of good and evil. We're not told what sort of tree either of these two special trees were, but we know there was nothing magical about them. Uh, there was nothing mystical about them, just trees, roots that you might have tripped over, with bark that you could feel, with leaves that you could break off, with fruits, and all the uh, chemistry that goes on within a plant happening in these trees. One of them, Adam and Eve, were permit, uh, prohibited to eat of. Uh, the day you eat of this tree, God had said to them, you will surely die, Genesis 2 and verse 17. So these two trees, and then this other tree then, the tree, uh, besides the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this other tree, the tree of life. Now there's a difference of opinion. It might be at least interesting for you to know that amongst Reformed Bible teachers. And the difference of opinion is, were Adam and Eve allowed to eat of this tree of life before the fall? That's a debate amongst some Reformed scholars. John Calvin, he seems to suggest, though when I read it I'm not completely convinced, he seems to suggest that they did eat of the tree of life uh, at this stage. He, he comments that it was an earnest of immortality that they might feel confident of the promise as often as they ate of the fruit. Seems to be saying that they could have eaten of this tree and every time they ate of it, they, they were confident of the promise that if Adam obeyed, there would be a life of bliss for the people of God. John Gill, uh, 18th century theologian, he wrote that there was no obstacle to this tree. It was designed for his, that's man's use, to support and to maintain his natural life. Others suggest that the fall happened so quickly after creation, that Adam and Eve wouldn't have had opportunity to eat of this tree. Others would say that they didn't eat of it, that they had no right to, as Adam was, you remember, in the covenant of works, was on probation, as it were, and if he had passed this test, he could have eaten of the tree. Our confessional standards, a larger catechism, refers to uh, a pledge with regarding this tree. In other words, it was a promise of everlasting life, of bliss, that everybody could have as Adam obeyed. Here's this tree, and it's promising a life of eternal bliss if Adam had obeyed. Jonathan Edwards, not the long jumper, uh, important one, uh, North American Pastor, theologian in the 1700s, Edward said that the tree of life didn't have fruit until after the fall. And then his lovely little comment, it was gay in blossom, promising the most excellent fruit. So it was a real tree in a real garden, and whether they ate of it before or not, it doesn't really matter. There was this promise, and it was stating that if Adam obeyed, well, they would have God's unbroken blessing. So that's a little bit about the identification of this tree. But then secondly, we remind ourselves of exclusion from the tree. So here's this real tree, and it's pointing, it's promising, it's symbolizing unbroken fellowship with God. It's speaking of a life of joy 
a life of purpose and meaning. Uh, it's speaking of a, an unbroken life of knowing God in a state of perpetual bliss. Adam and Eve can eat of this and live forever if Adam obeys. But Adam sinned. He didn't obey. He had one command from God. As we saw last Sabbath evening, he broke it. I wonder if you ever thought that when Adam and Eve broke that one command that God gave to him, he broke every other single commandment. The, ten, the, the summary of the moral law and the Ten Commandments. Well, think about it. No other gods before me. And Adam says, no, I'll be God. And he eats of the forbidden fruit. No other idols, God will say, in the days to come through Moses. But here's Adam, and he's breaking this command and his own reasoning. That's his idol. Command, the commandment will say not to take the Lord's name in vain. And here Adam and Eve, and they're saying that God, God's a liar. God doesn't want to bless them. The commandment will say, honor the Sabbath day. And when Adam and Eve eat of the forbidden fruits, They'll never have a heart for the Sabbath day by nature, nor no mere man will ever have a heart for the Sabbath day. The commander will say, Honour your parents. And Adam, as he ate of the forbidden fruits, has now ruined family life forever. The commandment will say, Do not murder. And Adam will eat, and he killed himself. And he brings murder into the world. The commandments would say no adultery. And as Adam eats of this, the, the marriage that God has designed, it will be, it'll be ruined. The commandments would say don't steal. And Adam, as he eats of it, he steals the character of God. The commandments will say no false witness. And Adam, in his eating, is saying God's a liar. The commandment will say no covenant. And Adam, he longs for something that he ought not to have should not have and all humanity as we saw last Lord's Day plunged into death with our representative head separated from God fellowship broken life marred life ruined creation destroyed but what now of the tree of life here's this tree that if Adam will eat of it and he live forever well, we're told in Genesis chapter 3 and 22 to 24 that he has no right to eat of it. Uh, this tree that speaks of abundant life, that's all over now for any mere man to have of himself. Can't eat of this tree of life and have the eternal bliss any more and live in fellowship with God. If Adam hadn't have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve could have partaken of this tree and lived forever in a state of harmony with God. But Adam didn't, and that opportunity was gone. And Adam and Eve now are, are banished, they're chucked out of the Garden of Eden. The wages of sin is death. And the Lord knew that Adam and Eve would want to take of the tree of life now. The Lord knew that they would want to try and sort out their mess themselves. They couldn't, of course. And to eat the tree of life now would have been an utter disaster for Adam and Eve. To eat of this tree of life now, they would have been condemned forever in a state of sin and misery with no hope ever of salvation, locked in, as it were, to eternal damnation rather than eternal bliss. So the barring from uh, the Garden of Eden Yes, it was a consequence of sin, but it was a, a severe mercy, we might say, of the living God. All that that tree pictured was beyond Adam now. Of course, this tree of life, 
would have remained for a little while in the Garden of Eden. But the cherubim now, with their flaming sword, they block the way. They cannot get to the tree of life. But it's still in there. Adam and Eve would have thought, surely. Perhaps that was a mercy of God too. Perhaps it was to stir them to have a little hint of a thought that perhaps some way, somehow, there'll be a way back to the tree of life. The tree of life obviously would have disappeared if it hadn't disappeared just with the destruction of the created order when the flood came. It would have gone with Eden. And it disappeared too from the pages of the Bible. Except for little hints. Do you remember them? Do you remember when we looked at the book of Exodus and God gave all those wonderful details about how the tabernacle was to be made with all the colours and the inside of the covering to remind God's people of Eden. And then God gives them the the instructions about a, 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 a lampstand like no other lampstand anybody has ever seen before or since. Do you remember what it was like? With all its cups and uh, oil flowing and blossoms. It was like the tree of life. A little hint that things aren't over for this tree. The days would pass and the generations would pass and men would come and go and God's people would come to the promised land and a king would be raised up. King David and his son Solomon after him and the Spirit would guide them to remember this tree of life. We sang about it. Speaking of our Saviour, he will be like a growing tree well planted by the waterside. Solomon, David's son, would write in Proverbs 13 that a desire fulfilled was like a tree of life. Years and generations would pass again and Ezekiel would, would prophesy in chapter 47 about a multitude of trees each side of a river giving life. And then as the Bible ends, this tree wonderfully and suddenly reappears in even greater glory. Life wasn't over. The God of grace had planned a way to the tree of life. So something of the identification of the tree, something of the exclusion from the tree, and then finally, as we reflect on this tree of life, the invitation to the tree of life. When we come to the book of Revelation, we saw it some weeks back now in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. These letters to the, the church, the churches in, uh, at that time in Revelation 2 and 7 to the church at Ephesus. Once more this message goes out about the tree of life. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And then as the book finishes, if you have your Bible open, I'll help you here. Chapter 22, verses 1 to 3. The angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him. So now here's this tree of life again. You remember, this is a vision that John is having. And it's not in a garden anymore, this tree of life. Now it's in a city. And it's to remind us of the Garden of Eden. And it's to remind us that the paradise lost by Adam was regained and bettered by the last Adam, Jesus Christ. John gives this little glimpse, is given this little glimpse, this vision of heaven, of paradise regained and more. 
And just in case you're confused, it's not a literal tree that uh, John is writing about here in this vision. Uh, hope it doesn't disappoint you, but, well, you're not even interested in thinking about it. When you get to heaven, you, you're not going to be able to go along and get a selfie beside this tree. It's, it's, this is visionary. This is pictorial language in this here. The picture has changed a little bit as well. It's not one tree anymore. William Hendrickson, the great commentator in Revelation, says now that it's developed into a, a, a parkland of the trees of life. It's, symbol, it's symbolic of the beauties of heaven. Now this tree of life, it's a great picture here of the enjoyments and the worship and the bliss of the people of God forevermore. It's yielding its fruit, these trees now. Uh, every month there's this picture of ongoing blessing for the people of God. There's never going to be a change in this blessing. People of all the nations are gathered here. We had a little hint of it this morning, hadn't we, with some Brazilian folk and Polish and South African and, and ourselves. And here's this little glimpse of heaven where the, the leaves of the, the tree were for the healing of the nations. Men and women from all the nations over healed because of what this tree and who this tree ultimately pointed to great work of the last Adam, the restorer, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can see in verse 3 that now there's no sorrow, there's no struggle, there's no doubts, no sadness, no grief, no illness, just perfection. And it never, ever changes. I'm looking forward to that. You think about it. Book of, Book of Revelation ends with the bride saying, Come. That's the church. That's the voice of the church. We sat at the Lord's table this morning. We reminded ourselves of those scriptures. And we do this in his remembrance, proclaiming his death until he comes. So it's good that we're here at the tree of life this evening. Because one of the things the Lord's supper is to do for us is to stir us to think of heaven. And so the Lord gives out this great invitation to the one who conquers, I will grant the right to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. That's your future, Christian. Do you wonder about your future? I wonder what the future holds for me. Well, your future in this life will have all sorts of things, ups and downs, I'm sure, as it is for many. But here's the future. In heaven... With all the blessings that are pictured here in this tree of life. How could it be, ever be true of anyone that the Lord could invite us to the tree of life and all that it pictures? How, how could that be the reality? To him who conquers, I'll give the right to the tree of life. Well, you think of what happened in Eden. Here is this cherubim with its bright, flaming, flashing sword blocking the way to the tree of life. Anybody trying to head to get to the tree of life, they're confronted with the fierce holiness of God. Isn't that what we found this morning? The Son of God made flesh, bearing our sins in his own body in the tree. And he went forward and endured the flashing sword of the wrath of God pierced for our transgressions and he opened the way to eternal life didn't he say it himself I am the way the truth and the life didn't he say in his prayer to his father in John 17 this is eternal life to know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent you know, ultimately it's our saviour who is this tree of life and brings all these blessings. Well, Eden must have been a, a wonderful place to live, wasn't it? Think of the beauty it is now to live with creation around about us, even marred. What must it have been like for Adam to have lived in Eden? Wouldn't he have said every moment for however long he was there, God did all this for me. Well, how much more in heaven, Christian? 
for all eternity. You and I will gaze round and we'll say, He did all this beauty, all this wonderful blessing. He did it for me. And he did it by his own blood. The way is not barred anymore. Sinners can enjoy all the blessing of the tree of life. Who gets the right? Well, we're told, aren't we, in verse 14? Blessed are those who wash their robes, so they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter the city by the gates. One way, through the finished work of Jesus Christ, nothing impure will ever enter this city, only those who are washed. And for the Christian, the supper that we've had today is to put us a skip in our step. One nanosecond, if there'll be such a thing in heaven, I don't think so, but you know what I mean. One nanosecond of seeing the delights of heaven and being with our Lord forever and anything that we've struggled with will be forever gone from our lives. So keep on. Be a conqueror by his grace and you'll see and enjoy all the blessings that are pictured in that tree of life and all opened up for us by our Saviour Jesus Christ and we'll say for all eternity as we worship him he did all this for me. Amen. Well we sing to God's praise from Psalm 96 these verses mark 7 to 10 Say to nations all the Lord reigns Yes the Lord is steadfastly fixed from moving He will judge the peoples all with equity Psalm 96a 7 to 10 we sing his praise Say to nations all the Lord pictures in our Bible to remind us of all that your son the Lord Jesus Christ has purchased for his people the right to eat of the tree of life we thank you for the joys of heaven that your son has purchased for us for a place where there's no more pain no more frustration no more troubles and no more difficulties eternal bliss we thank you to not just be paradise once more like Eden, but infinitely better. For never again will sin mar or destroy anything. Lord, we rejoice at the great promise that your Son is coming again. 
We add our voice to the voice of your bride through the ages. Come, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your patience. You've not come just yet. And have given another Sabbath day for the gospel to reverberate throughout this earth. We pray it will not return to you empty, but gather in more worshippers. Heals by the finished work of Jesus Christ, so that forever men and women will enjoy all the bliss of heaven. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.